This morning, as we jump back into our study through Titus, I wanted to ask you a question. And the question is, have you ever been deceived about anything? Have you ever been deceived? Most likely the answer is yes. Deception is part of our world. Or can you think of any famous stories of, of deception? I think of the children's fable, The Emperor's New Clothes, where some thieves wanted to steal the emperor's valuable wardrobe, and so they convince him that he's wearing clothes when he isn't. And he parades out into the, to the street, and all the, all the people affirm, oh, wow, great clothes, while in his deception he's been robbed. I think about it in my own life. I'm often deceived in thinking that fast food is healthy food. But you know that one of the dangerous things about deception is that it has consequences. Deception isn't just, a, isn't just a standalone thing that we say, oh, look, somebody was deceived. Deception, deception brings consequences. And in my own example of the fast food thing, if, if I fall into the deception of thinking fast food is healthy food and I just eat fast food and on and on and on and on, not only will I reap the benefits of that, but I'll actually lose a taste for healthy food. One of the consequences of eating food like that is I would, I would lose the taste for healthy food, and in losing the taste for healthy food, I would stop desiring healthy food. It's one of the consequences of that particular deception. Deception has consequences. One of the things that Paul will make plain in our text this morning is that false teachers who are deceivers, those who commit deception, false teachers are a constant danger in the church. They're a constant danger in the church. And Paul goes on to say that such people must be identified and such people must be rebuked. False teachers are a constant danger in the church they must be identified for who they are. They must be rebuked for their deception. So let me invite you, if you have your Bibles open to Titus chapter 1, to stand. If you are able, you can find it on the Pew Bible on page 998, if you don't have one to follow along with. Titus chapter 1, we'll pick up reading in verse number 9, going back to hear what Paul says about elders. He says, an elder must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. For there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers, especially those of the circumcision party. They must be silenced since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what they ought not to teach. One of the Cretans, a prophet of their own, said, Cretans are always liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. This testimony is true. Therefore, rebuke them sharply, that they may be sound in the faith, not devoting themselves to Jewish myths and the commands of people who turn away from the truth, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both in their minds and their consciences, they are defiled. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They are detestable, disobedient, unfit for any good work. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord God, we gathered this morning as your people, we've gathered on this Lord's Day to put ourselves beneath the authority of your word. And so, Father, we pray that you'd send the Holy Spirit to come and help us. Help us to hear, help us to see, help us to understand what you are saying to us this morning. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. You may be seated. So false teachers are a constant danger in the church who must be identified, they must be rebuked because one of the realities about holiness is that holiness is a matter of the heart. It's a matter of the heart. 
And in the Bible, the Bible does not separate the head and the heart and the body. The Bible treats us as one unit. And so sometimes false teaching tries to take pieces out of that and say, to be a Christian, it means to know the right things. Or to be a Christian means to do the right acts of obedience. Whereas the Bible says, no, holiness, which is what we're called to, The Bible says we are to be holy as our heavenly father is holy. Holiness is a matter of the whole person, which is what the Bible means when it says our hearts. It means our head, our feelings and emotions, and our bodies. Holiness is a matter of the whole person. And so knowing that false teaching tries to reduce holiness in some form or another, it is a danger. And the reality is the more we buy into false teaching, the more we are harmed And the more we are harmed by false teaching, listen closely, the more we are harmed by false teaching, the more of a distaste we develop for true teaching. Just like the more I eat fast food, the less I want healthy food, the more we buy into false teaching, the less we will want good teaching. Before we get started, let's remember where we've been the last few weeks because this is all important as we consider what Paul is saying. Several weeks back, we looked at the New Testament church as being God's organized, purposeful assembly that God gathers, forms, and gives purpose. That's what the church is. It's God's gathered people formed by his spirit for his purposes. And then we looked at what makes a church healthy. We said a healthy church does things God's way. False teaching will try to detract from that or distract from that. They'll want us to do things their way or a different way, but a healthy church does things God's way. A few weeks ago, we looked at elders, what Paul says about elders here in Titus, that God gives his church qualified godly men to watch over and guard the people of God by the word of God. And then two weeks ago, we looked at deacons. Deacons are servants in the household of God to guard the unity of the body. Now think about, and we'll see this more in just a moment, false teaching and false teachers will distract us from true teaching and bring in disunity. But God has already built in two things to protect that. Elders to watch over and teach the Bible rightly and deacons to guard the unity of the church. And so this morning, as we pick up in verse 10 of Titus chapter one, what we see is Paul is not beginning a new idea He's not starting something new. He's just continuing with the flow of thought that he began in verse number one of chapter one. He's just continuing his argument. And in particular, he's continuing his argument about why churches need elders, why they need shepherds to watch over the church. Look back at verse five of chapter one. Paul says to Titus, Titus, this is why I left you in Crete, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town. And so he asks the question, why is that job number one for Titus? Why is getting elders established in every church in every town important? And what we see here is that one of the most pressing reasons for Titus to do this is the reality that in the absence of qualified godly leadership, false teachers will come in and gain influence and lead churches astray. In the absence of qualified godly leadership, false teachers will come in, false teachers will exercise their authority, and they will lead churches astray. That doesn't mean that If the pulpit is vacant and false teachers will come in, sometimes it happens when somebody's filling the pulpit. What what, what, What Paul is saying is that when there aren't godly shepherds watching over the church, false teachers become very, very dangerous in the church, which is why Paul tells Titus, get qualified overseers in place. Recall what Paul says in verse 9. We read it just a moment ago. Those overseers must teach what is true and must correct what is false. They must teach sound doctrine and they must rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine, which is why in the main idea this morning, false teachers must be rebuked. 
They must be rebuked, and this ministry is entrusted to the elders. And this rebuking ministry is incredibly important. It is essential because it is for the protection of the church. But look in your Bibles at verse number 10, and the first word there, the word for. In the Greek, this is like a rope where uh, Paul is tying together two different sections. He's taking what he's just said about elders and he's tying it to what he's about to say about false teachers. So they are connected. So that's why we picked up in verse nine, that an elder must be, must hold to the word, teach sound doctrine, rebuke those who contradict it for or because, Paul is saying, there are many who are insubordinate, empty talkers and deceivers. Paul doesn't say there are a few. He says there are many. And remember what Peter says in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 1. Peter says there will always be false teachers among you. It's not a danger that, that lurks sometimes and sometimes it doesn't. Peter says false teaching, false teachers are always a danger. It's a persistent problem in the church, which is why churches must do the work of getting qualified overseers in place. So let's consider what Paul is saying here in verses 10 through 16. He's given us some of the characteristics of false teachers so that we might know who to look for. You know, Paul really holds no punches here. He's not trying to, to persuade these false teachers to hear reason. If you read this again, it comes, it sounds more like Paul's coming out of the corner like a heavyweight boxer, just slugging his opponent. He's not concerned about their feelings at all. He's not concerned about their emotions at all. He says, look, they're insubordinate, they're empty talkers, they're deceivers, they do what they ought not do, and even one of their own says they're lazy and gluttonous, and he's right. He's not concerned with the feelings and emotions of these false teachers. More likely, he's like a papa bear or a mama bear whose cubs are under attack from a predator and the only desire he has is to protect his children by taking out the threat. That's the image here. That's the image, which is why he's so direct and he's so hard hitting. Before we look at the characteristics, we need to understand, well, what is false teaching? Because it's not up for our opinion. We need to understand what does the Bible say about what false teaching is? Because Paul gives two, two categories here about what false teaching is. The first one is the category of substance. That false teachers will teach a message that contradicts the Bible, either in a big flashy way or in a more subtle way that's harder to see. I wish, I wish when false teaching arrived, it would have a label on it that says, this is false teaching. <laughs> that would be much easier for us to determine, hey, this is bad, I ought not listen to this. But, but a lot of times, false teaching shows up with the ring of truth. It will sound good to some extent, which is why it's so dangerous. But Paul says the, the first category of false teaching is the actual message of what's being said. But the second thing Paul adds to it is the lifestyle of the teacher. And that's not something I think we consider often. I think, and, and, this is, and this is, I think, is an influence from TV and media. Because when we cut the TV on, we're not looking for somebody's lifestyle. We're just listening to what they say. And yet in Scripture... In scripture, Paul and others attach it together. Don't listen to what someone says until you know how they live. Now, I am not, uh, I am not decrying any of the TV preachers. There are some that are terrible, and you ought not listen to them. But there are some that are, that are genuinely good. But I think it's just one of, the, one of the consequences that we have fallen under is we tend to separate what someone says from how they live. But Paul says, no, these things go together. We listen to the substance of what they say, and then we look at how they live, and that'll become clearer in just a moment. And so a false teacher is a person who exhibits one or both of these categories, that they're teaching a false message, or that they're teaching something that's true, but living falsely. Both of those are are dangerous. Let's consider these characteristics that Paul lays out about who false teachers are. And the first thing he says there in verse 10 is that there are many who are insubordinate. 
So he says false teachers will be insubordinate or literally they'll be rebellious, disobedient people. False teachers will ultimately not submit themselves to the authority of the word of God. They might have a Bible, they might own a Bible, they might even quote the Bible, but when the rubber meets the road, this will not be their authority. They will be their own authority, their agenda will be their own authority, they will not submit to the word of God. They will rebel against it. And all throughout this text, we'll see Paul jumping back and forth between what must be true of an elder and what is true of a false teacher. Because look back in chapter 1 at verse 6. Paul says, he's talking about elders, if anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an elder, an elder cannot even have insubordinate children and occupy his office. But Paul says here in verse 10, false teachers themselves are insubordinate people. They are rebellious people. False teachers are disobedient to the word of God. But the second thing he says is that false teachers are empty talkers. They're empty talkers, or literally their talk is of no value. It's not for the building up of, of the body of Christ. When these people talk, it's not seasoned with, with scripture. It's not meaningful. It doesn't do you any good. We were going to add a mental picture to this. These are the people in a conversation. When the conversation gets heated, they just shoot from the hip. They're not aiming. They're not trying to be careful. They're just spewing out of their mouths whatever comes. And have you, have you ever been in a, in a situation where you said something in the heat of the moment and you wished as soon as you felt it leaving your mouth, I should not have said that. Paul says false teachers are those who just say things without thinking them through. Listen to what the rest of Scripture says about that particular action. Proverbs 15, verse 2 says, The tongue of the wise commends knowledge, but the mouths of the fools pours out folly. The tongue of the wise commends knowledge. So you hear in that verse, there's a conversation. But then the fool, it says, their mouths just pour it out. They just speak without considering. You know, James says in James chapter 1, verse 19, let every person be quick to listen, slow to speak, slow to get angry. Because the mouth of a fool pours out foolishness. In 1 Timothy, Paul speaking to the young pastor Timothy in the city of Ephesus, chapter 1, verse 6 says, false teachers forsake the truth and wander off into vain discussion. False teachers will not want to hold a conversation about the Bible, number one, because they can't. They will not want to talk about Scripture because they know in their hearts they are not committed to Scripture, and so they wander off into vain discussion. You ever been in a conversation where someone just won't get to the point? They keep rabbit trailing because you, you want to pin them to the wall, you want to talk about what's, what we're here to talk about, but they keep distracting because they don't want to talk about the point? That's what Paul's saying. They won't have a conversation about the truth because they keep derailing themselves, forsaking the truth and wandering off into vain discussion. Or think about what Paul says in 2 Timothy 2.16. False teachers speak irreverent babble. It's not godly. It's actually ungodly. They're just babbling. They're not saying anything of worth. They're just running their mouths. And he says in 2 Timothy, they speak irreverent babble and they lead themselves into ungodliness and others. You see there the consequence of that deception? Not only are false teachers speaking in ungodly ways, but they're leading the people they're talking to into ungodliness. Paul says these false teachers are empty talkers. But the third thing he says is that false teachers are deceivers. They are deceivers. They mislead others through lies and deceptions. 2 Timothy 3, Paul says this, such people, talking about false teachers, are deceived themselves and mislead others. You think about how much, how much time and energy Paul is, is using 
instructing these young pastors about false teachers. If you were, if you were gonna speak to somebody who's growing up in your profession and you only had a limited amount of time to write to them, think about the time and energy that Paul is spending writing about false teachers to these young pastors. He mentioned it in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. All three letters in the New Testament to young pastors are full of instruction about how to deal with false teachers. And Paul says to Timothy, false teachers are those who are deceived themselves but don't know it and they mislead other people. They're deceived themselves and they mislead other people. They deceive people about their intentions. They don't want you to know what they're about. Paul says to Titus in verse 11, they must be silent since they are upsetting whole families by teaching for shameful gain what ought not be taught. They're teaching for shameful gain. They don't want you to know what they're after because it is shameful. Listen to what Paul says about what must be true of an elder back up in verse number seven. Titus one, verse seven. An overseer as God's steward must be above reproach, not arrogant, quick tempered, a drunkard or violent. He must not be greedy for gain whether that's financial gain or popularity gain or influence or whatever, an overseer, a true elder in the church of God must not be greedy for gain, but a false teacher will teach for shameful gain. Paul's saying these people stick out like sore thumbs if you know where to look. Going back to Proverbs again, the book of wisdom. Proverbs 15, verse 16 says, Better is a little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble with it. False teachers try to amass things for themselves shamefully. But the Bible says it's better to have just a little bit and rightly fear the Lord than to have as much as you can and get it however you can because that will bring trouble. False teachers are deceivers. Verse 11, Paul says, you can pick out a false teacher because they're disunifying. He says they upset whole families or literally they ruin families. They destroy families by teaching what ought not be taught. They drive wedges. They, they bring disunity where they ought not do that. We see this in 1 Timothy chapter 4, where some of the false teachers in the church of Ephesus were teaching things like you ought not get married and you need, to, you need to avoid certain food groups. That was just how it was showing up in particular in Ephesus. There was a group of ladies saying you ought not get married because it's, it's bad. But false teaching changes and it morphs and it takes on all kind of different messages because in our in our modern day it could be things like affirming gay marriage or affirming the delusion of transgenderism and in these two things in particular we see them literally tearing households and other denominations apart the united methodist church is being torn apart over the issue of of gay marriage because people are teaching things that ought not be taught but as I said, false teaching can, can take any form. And so it's literally anything that leads a family away from the truth of the word of God. It could be a nuclear family, a husband and wife and children. It could be an extended family. It could be a church family. Anything that drives a family away from the truth of the word of God is false teaching. Anything that ought not be taught. It might be a lie or gossip, anything that turns people against each other, away from the word of God, Paul says false teachers are disunifying. The final thing he says is that false teachers are hypocritical and they are unrighteous. In verse 15, Paul says, to the pure, all things are pure, but to the defiled and unbelieving, nothing is pure, but both their minds and their consciences are defiled. You see, to the Christian, to the pure is what, is what Paul is getting at. To the Christian, we understand that our hope, that our purity, that our salvation is found in Jesus Christ alone. 
that I am pure because he is pure, that there's nothing in this world that can defile me because I am in Christ. There is sin, sure, but I am held firmly in Jesus Christ. But to the false teacher, the false teacher takes the the pure message of the gospel and defiles it by adding things to it. They'll teach things like you have to obey this set of rules and believe in Jesus. Or think about what Jesus talked to the Pharisees about in Mark chapter 7. He says, guys, you've gotten really good at measuring out all your spices and washing your hands at the right time. But out of your heart are coming all of these utterly defiling things. Because false teachers don't understand the gospel. They don't understand true purity because they are, as Paul says, defiled in their minds and in their consciences. And here is one of the most, here's one of the most damning things that Paul says about them. They profess to know God, but they deny him by their works. They will profess to know God, but deny him by their works works. False teachers will talk a good religious talk. I said, it'd be really easy if false teaching and false teachers would show up with a badge on so we could see them. But false teachers will talk a good religious talk and we will be tempted to follow them because we have gotten in the habit of judging people based on what they say. If they say the right things, if they have enough influence, I'll, I'll follow them and not look at anything else about their lives. But Paul says false teachers are those who say the right things, but then deny those things with how they live. Now think about, if you will, a few weeks ago, what Paul says about elders. He gives very little emphasis on their skill level. He gives almost all the emphasis on how they live. It says, if you're going to appoint a man to be an overseer, make sure his home is in order. Make sure he is well thought of. Make sure his temper is under control. Make sure the only thing controlling him is the word of God. And he says, and false teachers will give the exact opposite reality. They'll say the right things, but they will show themselves to be hypocrites. Paul continues his onslaught against these dangerous people by quoting someone from their own community. Not someone inside the Cretan churches. He quotes somebody from the store up here. (laughs) He says, you've got one of your own prophets, a Cretan, who said Cretans are just liars, evil beasts, and lazy gluttons. And then he says, and it's true. He said, look, these false teachers have a reputation in the community, and the community knows who they are, and y'all are blind to it. There's a a non-Christian up at the store who knows this guy's reputation, but y'all just won't. And so he's adding credibility as he attacks these violent, dangerous people. He says they're known in the community for who they are. But remember, remember, what does Paul say about overseers in 1 Timothy 3, 7? He says before a man can ever be an elder in the church of God, he must be well thought of by outsiders. False teachers will be known for their hypocrisy in the community, but a true shepherd in God's church will have a good reputation outside, even outside of the church. And so as we read back in verse 10, what we see is that Paul is not saying this generally. He's not saying be on the lookout for insubordinate, empty talking, deceptive, hypocritical people. Now he is, but he goes a step further and identifies them. This is not a general application. He says to Titus, for you, brother, it's some of the Jews. He just identifies them. It's some of the Jews. Some of the circumcision party. Verse 14, he says, they're devoting themselves to Jewish myths. And in chapter 3, verse 9, he says, they get tied up in disputes about the law. Something similar was going on in the Galatian churches where people were teaching those churches. You have to believe in Jesus and you have to follow the law. It's a concrete problem in almost every single church. It happened then, it's happening now. It shows up in places like the sexual revolution going on in our society. It shows up in things like politics, People think if we just get the right elected officials in office, then all things will be well. It shows up in things like denominational traditions. 
You can follow Jesus, but you can't be a member of this church unless you do this. False teaching is anything that adds to Christ or substitutes something for Christ. It shows up in books. It shows up in the writings of people like Joel Osteen. Or a very popular Christian novel that came out several years ago entitled The Shack. The Shack teaches a heretical doctrine about who God is. It shows up in personal ideas. When we say things like, well, this is my opinion about the word, and do you have a different opinion about the word? God is not interested in our opinions. God has spoken. False teaching can show up in all kinds of places. But Paul is not just identifying them for us. He says there is a response to be taken, and the response is this. They must be silenced and rebuked. False teachers must be silenced and rebuked. And he he puts this in the ministry of the elders. An elder must know sound doctrine, teach it, and rebuke those who contradict it. And the first reason that elders do this is to guard the church. Elders must do this ministry of rebuking to guard the church. Don't forget what these guys were doing. It could be ladies too. It was ladies in the church in Ephesus that were teaching false things. When false teachers come into churches, they teach things that they ought not teach. And Paul says, families are destroyed, unity is done away with, and people are let off into ungodliness. That's a terrible thing to happen to a church. If that's the path of a church, then it's on the path to not being a church anymore. Think about what Jesus says to the churches in Revelation. He says, you have a lampstand, but I'll come and snatch it away. Because Jesus expects his churches to walk in obedience. And one of the reasons why elders are to rebuke false teaching is to guard the church. Think about it in Thessalonica. Paul writes these letters to the Thessalonians. They had, they had come under false teaching about the return of Jesus. They thought they missed it, and so they were living sinfully. They heard something false, they believed it, and they were doing something sinful. And so Paul writes to them and says, you've fallen under false teaching. Or think about Corinth. There were some people that showed up in Corinth after Paul left that had convinced the Corinthian church that Paul was not to be listened to. And so the church began to reject Paul. Or think about in Galatia. Paul writes to the Galatians. He says, I'm so astonished that you have so quickly left the true gospel and started believing this false gospel. So elders must exercise this responsibility to rebuke them because it's so dangerous, it's so present. And so it's no surprise that Paul comes down harshly and says, they must be silenced. They must not be given a word. The only option for such people is silence. But this is not just to beat these people up. Paul is not the boxer that slugs out his opponent and then stands over their body and says, ha, ha, ha. He knocks them down, but look at what he says. Verse 14, verse 13. Therefore, he says, rebuke them sharply, that, so that they may be sound in the faith. One of the reasons why elders must rebuke those who contradict sound doctrine is in hopes that they will come to true faith. When elders enter a season where they must offer a rebuke, it's never done harshly, it's never done belittlingly, it's always done with the conviction of the word and the hope of repentance. A good elder, a good shepherd of God's people will rebuke gently but truthfully. A good shepherd of the people of God will rebuke gently, but truthfully. And so the question before us this morning is, what what do we do with this? Paul says this to Titus, but, but what do we as a church do with this? And the first thing we need to understand is we need to get down as a matter of fact. Holiness is a matter of the heart. Christianity is not about knowing the right answers. Christianity is not about attending church enough. Christianity is not about checking all the religious boxes. Christianity is about knowing Christ crucified and raised. 
It's about believing in our hearts and our minds that Christ died on the cross for my sins, that he was buried in my place, and that God has raised him to life that I might have life. And the Bible is clear. When that takes hold of me, I am changed. But false teachers know the right things to say, but they lack the holiness that comes with the true gospel. Paul says they'll say the right things, but they'll deny it through how they live. And the sad reality, friends, is that so many people do that even today. There are people that sit in churches just like this, perhaps even you this morning. You will say the right things, but when you leave, your life denies that you actually believe it. Holiness is not a matter of checking a religious box. Holiness is knowing Christ crucified and receiving the transformation that comes with it. But a second thing we must do, churches must value and honor the rebuking ministry of their elders. Churches must value and honor the rebuking ministry of their elders. I don't know if you've ever rebuked somebody. It is not pleasant. It's not pleasant to look at someone and say, you are wrong, stop it. And so many times churches will push this ministry to the side for that very reason. It's uncomfortable, it'll cause a problem, it'll hurt feelings. But the alternative is when churches disregard this ministry, the alternative is ungodliness comes up, disunity comes up, families are torn apart, All kinds of worse consequences come. And so churches must honor and value the ministry, the rebuking ministry of their their elders. Churches must be obedient to God, first in having qualified overseers, but also in standing with them in right rebuking of false teaching. And then third and finally, church, we must be vigilant about holding to right teaching. The church lives and dies on good teaching or bad teaching. Paul puts so much emphasis on getting the right men in place so that we are hearing and eating the right food. So from the pulpit to the Sunday school room to personal conversation, church, we must be holding to the truth of the word of God. Let's pray together. Lord God, we love you. We thank you for speaking to us so faithfully through your word. And Father, we want to be a people who know you, who love you, who hear rightfully from you. And so Father, we pray that you would guard us against false teaching. And Father, you do that as we get to know your true word more and more. And so Father, may we be people of the word. May you guard the message that comes from this pulpit. Father, may we trust you. May we trust your word. May we devote ourselves to your word. We pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.